So welcome everyone. Uh, the speaker today is Noah Gian Siracusa and the title of his talk is Geometry of Supreme Court Voting. Okay, well, thanks for the invitation. So this is a, a slightly odd talk and topic, but it's, um, you know, topology and geometry have been entering data science in, in various capacities. And there's kind of larger movements like topological data analysis that you're familiar with. So what I wanna talk about is, is kind of a orthogonal approach, which is not developing a whole general systematic collection of tools that we can use topology or geometry and data science, but it's kind of turning things around just saying, let's find a specific problem that seems kind of interesting to people in some applied setting and kind of step back from there and start to unravel the mathematical structures that might be there. Um, I'll have to admit I'm a little bit biased because when I started doing this, this is actually when I was back at, I started this when I was at Swarthmore, which is an undergraduate college and it was collaborative. It was a research project with an undergraduate. So we, we kept it pretty elementary and that'll be true of this talk as well. Um, but I'm a little bit biased because I'm a mathematician. So what I find most interesting is the mathematics. So it's almost like, it's not like we're trying to solve some problem in political science or legal theory by using geometry. It's kind of the opposite. We took some data or some topics that come up in political science. And for us, the success was, can we find any kind of mathematical structure at all? And if so, you know, is it interesting? And what does it look like? And what does it say? So it's kind of a going from applied to math rather than taking math and applying it to the real world. But I think both are fun and you know, why not? Look for math where you can find it. That's part of our jobs. Okay, so this is not a slide that I made, but it's just a figure that I wanted to start out with, which is you've probably heard about the Supreme Court in general. You know, um, what I'm going to talk about in theory, it applies to any kind of voting situation. It doesn't even have to be uh, judicial. So like Congress, any anything where people, um, it doesn't make sense as much for a large body like a whole country, but any sort of voting system where there's a relatively small group of people. So what I'll focus on today is specifically the United States Supreme Court, which is uh, what's called the highest appellate court. What that means is a very small percentage of the cases that the, the court hears originated at that level in that court. So I forget the number, but something like 98 or 97% of the cases they hear, what happens is they start out a lower, like at a state court and go to the federal level and then go all the way up to the Supreme Court. So as cases are appealed, they go higher and higher until eventually this is the final court that has to resolve these issues if they choose to do so. So it's very influential because it's, you know, one of the main pillars of our democracy and, you know, what they, they basically are trying to interpret laws, interpret the constitution and what they say really affects our society. So it's in the news for a lot, and I'm sure you heard about it a lot with um, any time a Supreme Court justice like RBG recently passed away and was replaced. You'll hear a lot about it, and almost universally the discussion is how the the if a justice oh, sorry the the judges on this court for some reason are called justices. I'm not sure why. So I'll use those words interchangeably. But the the conversation you always hear about in the media, and it's a fair conversation, is how replacing one judge with another is going to shift the balance of the court. And the idea is you think of there as being liberal judges and conservative judges. So if we lose a liberal one like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and we replace her with a conservative one, that's tipping the balance of the court. So that seems reasonable. And you know, we all, if you follow these things, you kind of have a sense of who the liberals are and who are the conservatives. But should there be a more precise way of deciding what, where exactly the balance is, who exactly is liberal, who's more liberal than the others? So this is a really fun figure that was made by these uh, very prominent uh, political scientists. So this uses a pretty complicated, or at least a pretty sophisticated method of, uh, based on Bayesian statistics, where they're trying to estimate everyone's ideology. The way to read this graph, you don't have to look at the details, it's just a fun figure you can kind of glance at. But from left to right is proceeding through time, so that's historical. And from bottom to top is going from liberal to conservative. And each curve here, like if you look at this color here, this is the Rehnquist. So that's when he entered the court in 19, looks like, I don't know, 72 or something. So that's when he first entered the court. And the way they color coded this black means this, the chief justice. Chief justice doesn't actually have that many special powers. So he went along here. And what this is showing is that he actually started out more conservative. And as he spent time on the bench, he actually drifted to become more, a little bit more liberal, but closer to the center, but still center right. Then he left and Roberts became the new chief justice. And also Roberts has kind of 
uh, drifted a little bit to the left. In fact, if you look overall, I just find this chart fascinating. You know, it's messy. It's this crazy spaghetti plot. It's kind of fascinating. Look at, there's so many interesting trends, like not universally, but there's so many regions where you see a gentle kind of downward to the right uh, slant, which means there does seem to be a tendency for judges to be appointed and then kind of slowly become more liberal as they spend time on the bench. But there's certainly exceptions earlier on, it seemed like it was tending the opposite. So this is, we don't have to really unravel this. I just wanted to give a starting point of this should already strike us as kind of fascinating, right? It looks not immediately geometric, but it looks like there's a ton of structure, a lot of interesting things going on. There must be mathematics behind this, right? I mean, at the very least, I think that's that's what I want the takeaway to be. So where did they do this or how did they, they do this method? Again, I don't want to go into the details, but the Bayesian aspect is they started with prior estimates that's based on the political party of the president who appointed them. So, you know, if Trump appoints you versus if Obama appoints you, you can kind of guess one's gonna be more liberal or conservative. Um, a lot of these judges were judges on lower courts. They had a track record. They published op-ed articles, so they had a track record. So the basing aspect is they took all this prior information and then they would update it and revise that based on the actual votes that were happening. And it's difficult because a lot of times you have to take a case that's kind of not so clear cut and decide what the liberal outcome versus the conservative is. And, and you know, that's often very subjective in cases are very technical involve lots of issues. So it's very hard to do this, even though it looks precise and numerical, there's a lot of, um, I don't wanna say questionable, but there's a lot of difficult aspects to quantifying all this. So I wanna step back and do something simpler, but that's remarkably works well. So there's this cool thing called multidimensional scaling. This isn't specific to political science, but it's been, it's kind of a general data science thing you can do, or even you can call it a mathematical thing, but it's been kind of adopted more heavily in social sciences than in other realms. So the idea is if you have, um, there's something called a gram matrix you might've heard of. If you have a bunch of points in a metric space, a finite number, let's say it's n points, you can build the n by n matrix of all their pairwise distances. That thing is called a gram matrix. If I have, there's certain restrictions, right? Like the diagonal entries are all going to be zero. The matrix as a whole is going to be non-negative. The more subtle restrictions are the triangle inequality is going to be embedded somewhere, right? If you have a, a gram matrix. So not every non-negative matrix with zeros down the diagonals, or even if you impose things like uh, positive semi-definite, you can try various restrictions, but not every matrix is a gram matrix, means comes from an actual configuration. And even if you if you want to restrict further, you could say not just an abstract metric space, but you know, let's look for points in a Euclidean space. So what multidimensional scaling does is it basically approximates, well, it tries to do this for any matrix. It tries to approximate any non-negative matrix with a gram matrix. And this particular multidimensional scaling does this for Euclidean space. Another way to put it is if you have n objects and you have n, let's call them pseudo distances, things that are in some vague respect, it doesn't even have to be mathematically precise, something like a distance between each pair of these n things, multidimensional scaling, it's abbreviated MDS, will try to construct a configuration of n points in the Euclidean space of the dimension you specify, where the gram matrix, meaning all the pairwise distances, are as close as possible to the original kind of pseudo distances. So, you know, that's kind of a mouthful, but there's some really cool examples you can do. Like one people often do to illustrate is you can, um, you can look, feed this algorithm a bunch of, uh, like the distances between a bunch of cities and ask for it to come up with like a planar embedding of these cities just based on their pairwise distances. And what you get actually looks very close to the actual geographic layout of the cities. So in other words, it's you know, not an obvious fact, but from the pairwise distances, you can kind of reconstruct the, the global geometry. But where this really shines is when you have things that there aren't actual distances. So here's what's done in the, in the kind of social sciences and political science community. And at least here's it specifically in this voting setting. So the Supreme Court has nine judges. And here's a simplification that I'm gonna use throughout this talk. And this is one of the steps where uh, part of why I wanted to give this talk to this audience is I feel like there's more geometry and topology. There's more layers to this that I haven't figured out that I haven't seen anywhere in the literature. So I'm hoping someone in the audience will have ideas of, of kind of the next steps to take this. So here's the simplification. Every case that reaches the Supreme Court, 
basically at the end of the day, these nine judges give a vote that's either affirm or reverse, which means they're either agreeing with the previous lower court's decision or they're disagreeing with it and they're reversing it. So you can really think of that as a binary thing, a one or a zero. So here's how we want to try to come up with distances between the judges because we want to come up with some sort of geometric model showing where they lie. Even just doing this in one dimension is useful as you'll see. So here are the distances that we're going to do. Let's just take all the cases that these nine judges heard together. So this is a span of six years for this particular collection. So they heard hundreds of, of cases during these six years, probably close to like a thousand. So it's a lot of cases. And all we're going to do is count the percentage of cases where they disagreed. So for instance, uh, take a very conservative judge like Scalia and a very liberal judge like Ginsburg. And you would expect that often they would disagree on cases. So they're going to have a large distance between them versus two liberals like Ginsburg and Sotomayor. Sotomayor are going to agree more often. So, so all these numbers are depicting are the pairwise disagreement rates. So out of, you know, let's say they heard a thousand cases, if two justices voted the same way, meaning either they both affirmed or they both reversed in 900 out of these thousand cases, then they're, they'll agree 90% of the time, their disagreement distance will be uh, one per, uh, 10%, so 0.1. Okay, so let's just check. Um, so down the diagonal are zeros because the judge always agrees with themselves. And let's look at Scalia and Thomas, for instance is 10%, uh, 12%. So those are two conservative justices. They happen to agree quite often. So they only disagree with each other on 12% of the cases versus Scalia and Ginsburg disagree 34% of the time. So that roughly makes sense, right? The liberal conservative have bigger distance than the, than the conservative conservative. One thing that struck me when I first looked at this matrix is when you hear about the Supreme Court in the media, you kind of get this impression that the liberals always vote one way and the conservatives always vote the opposite. But notice that that's very much not the case, right? Probably the most conservative judge for this span of years and the most liberal, like very extreme politically, they actually agreed with each other, uh, what is that, 66% of the time? So, you know, two thirds of the time they actually are agreeing. They're only disagreeing with each other one third of the time. It's just that if you take people who are more ideologically similar, they actually agree closer to, you know, 85 or 90 percent of the time. Okay, so that's just kind of the matrix that I'm building. So again, there's nothing having to do with triangle inequalities or metrics or any mathematical properties here. These are really just, I mean, there might be some further properties of this matrix, but we don't really need to use anything. Multidimensional scaling, the algorithm works for anything. And here's what it does. You specify the dimension. And it'll, it basically solves a fairly straightforward optimization problem using singular value decomposition, just kind of linear algebra stuff, to find a, collect, a collection of nine points. So let's say we'll first do this on the line. It'll find a collection of nine points on the line where the pairwise distances between these points are as close as possible to the, the entries here in this matrix. So in this picture, this is really one dimensional. I just, um, and with Breyer and Kagan, they had such similar values. I just listed them separated like this, but so you could read the two names. But really, these are at basically the same point. Thomas and Alito are almost the same point. Thomas is just further to the right. So don't just ignore the vertical layout here. It's, this is purely horizontal. So what you see here are, if you happen to know these names, if you've followed American national uh, judicial politics type of stuff, these are indeed the liberal judges. Ginsburg, as I said, was this liberal judge who justice who recently passed away. Kennedy was known as, um, he retired just a couple of years ago. He was known as kind of the centrist judge and here he is sitting right in the middle and here are the conservative judges. So this kind of makes sense. What's amazing, what I really love about this is you have to step back and realize this is pretty much what anyone in the media, what anyone in this room, what anyone in politics would say are the political alignments of these judges. We know that Thomas and Scalia and Alito are the far right ones. Roberts is a conservative, but not as extreme. Kennedy's the swing justice in the middle. These are the, this is exactly what you'd expect. And yet we didn't use any political information. This is not like the Bayesian one. This had nothing to do with political parties, with the content of the cases. We have, you know, this doesn't know anything about free speech or gun rights or anything. It's really just how frequently do these judges agree or disagree with each other and this beautiful one-dimensional layout emerges.
the one thing I just want to mention since you're a mathematical audience is there is a, a kind of symmetry ambiguity here. The algorithm um, in this case could be left, right, reversed, right? That'll produce the same pairwise distances. So I always cheat and just put the left to be what we you know, colloquially use the word left to mean politically. So if you just run this, you might see a mirror image of this, but that's the only ambiguity. I mean, there could be a horizontal translation, but that doesn't matter. No, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So this plot is sort of purely mathematical because it's only mm -hmm. off of the voting record, right? Have you mm -hmm. seen people been able to make, in, in some sense, as purely mathematical plot as possible that is also time varying? I mean, it's harder because the voting records don't all overlap as much, but yeah, have that's... people done versions of that? That I have not seen as much because it's kind of relative to each other. So yeah. that's what that's unfortunately the, the main thing we're losing here is yeah. if a new justice enters, like here we knew Rehnquist Rink was conservative and we could see, but here we don't have that. If you have a new justice, they have no voting record with the previous justices. So we have no, right. you know, there's really no way to compare. So every time you lose a judge and gain a judge, you kind of have to start over. The interesting thing though, is if you just take a, a slice through time, then the pictures you get here are remarkably similar to the ones that use more nuanced information. So cool. you want to do what you said, it's, it's, I don't, haven't seen people able to do it, but Modulo being able to do that, this is fairly compatible with the, the more advanced method. Thanks. And again, this is, you know, general and it's naive, but you know, it's awesome if something naive works pretty well. <laughs> okay, I know I can so, ask a question as well. Yeah, go for it. So if you can go uh, just back. So I think it's, it's interesting to, you know, to a certain extent, if you try to characterize the politics in a one dimensional way, this is what you get. But the, maybe the extent to which it's not one dimensional is characterized by, let's say, the remaining sum of the eigenvalues. So how good of a fit is this one dimensional embedding? Is it pretty good at capturing the geometry? Yeah, or that's, is it, or that's is not? a fantastic question. And, and but that leads perfectly to the next slide, but it's actually a great question. The way multidimensional scaling works is, I don't know the right mathematical word, but it's sort of iterative by dimension. So if you ask the algorithm to do this in two dimensions, it'll first produce a one dimensional layout that you know, minimizes the distances between the entries of the gram matrix you get from this configuration and the original input matrix. If you asked it to do it in two dimensions, it'll first do that for the X coordinate, get that as good as it can, and then without touching the X coordinate, it'll start to move them in the Y direction in order to improve the, to further minimize those distances. So the point is when you do this in two dimensions, it doesn't start from scratch. Another way to put it mathematically is if you do two dimensional MDS and project down onto the X axis linearly, the result will be identical to the one dimensional MDS. So here's a picture of three dimensions. To me, three dimensions is a little bit too, hard to see and kind of interpret. So I'm mostly, basically the punchline of this talk is there's been many, many like decades of discussion and research and scholarship on one dimension. And just in the last few years, some people have been working on two dimensions. So I'm not gonna do anything about three dimensions. We're not there yet, but one could in theory. So I guess you have to look at the scale to kind of answer um, your question. But my, I, from what I've seen, the first two dimensions seem to capture much of the variance. You can even kind of see intuitively here with the scale is fairly small. There's not a lot of further variance within this third dimension. So the distances don't improve a lot. This method, by the way, is a little bit similar to principal component analysis, where you know, you're choosing a number of dimensions to project down to, and you can see how much variance you're capturing. And you get that chart where you see, oh, if I keep going out this many dimensions, I'm not getting much more variance. So you have similar things like that. I just want to highlight what's interesting with MDS as opposed to PCA. PCA, you think of as dimension reduction. You start with coordinates and you're building linear combinations out of those. What's really cool about, and that's very, very useful. What's cool with MDS is we didn't start with coordinates. We didn't start with any Euclidean embedding. We're creating a Euclidean embedding from these pairwise distances. So I think of PCA as simplifying the geometry through linear projection whereas MDS is creating the geometry in the first place. But that said, um, there are very similar ideas as you're saying to kind of measure how many dimensions you really need to go. But the answer is in this case, you actually do get quite a lot more by going from one to two, but from two to three, it doesn't seem like a lot more happens. Okay, so this is just a picture, but don't worry about it. It's just, I tried it for three and I couldn't make much sense of it. 
So as I said, this talk is really going to focus on two, and it's because of the um, the question that you just asked, which is, well, you know, one dimension, which is all I ever really hear about in the news. I mean, first of all, you have to agree, right? If we, when RVG passed away and we heard about um, Amy, Amy Coney Barrett coming in, all the discussion was, does this shift the court to the left, to the right, how much? But that's all presuming that there's a one dimensional axis that explains everything. So what I wanna talk about in this, this talk today is really what happens in the second dimension. The cool thing about MDS, like PCA is, we don't have to decide ahead of time what this dimension is encoding. We don't have to program it in, you know, saying, oh, this is measuring some kind of non-political but some other legalistic view. We literally just run the algorithm and it's gonna put as much as it can in the x-axis. And as I said, this is compatible. So if you take this picture and project it down onto the x-axis, you will get that one-dimensional picture. So whatever vertical spread you're seeing here, there's MDS, the algorithm, has just by using these input matrices, has created a second dimension that's helping it get these uh, disagreement rates more accurate. So what do we see here? Well, it's kind of an interesting mess. People are sort of scattered all over, but you do see that among the liberals, for instance, Ginsburg and Kagan and Sotomayor are kind of similar. Breyer, from a, a left-right perspective, oh, by the way, the main punchline from this slide is that it's safe for me to say left, right, liberal, conservative, the first dimension that MDS creates in all examples that we've ever seen really does seem to match political leanings. So throughout the talk, anytime I talk about left and right, it's okay to think of that either politically or as the x-axis in an MDS plot because they seem to be basically the same. So the question really is what's the second dimension and, and how do these interact? So as I said, Breyer here is liberal. And if you think one dimension, it looks very similar. In fact, remember this picture, Breyer and Kagan look nearly identical. But going back to your question, what does the second dimension reveal? Well, it reveals that Breyer and Kagan are actually quite far apart if we do look indeed in the second dimension. I think I've, yeah, these are different scales. So the whole picture I think is a little bit more vertically compressed than horizontal. But nonetheless, you see, it's not such a simple left to right thing. There is a lot of vertical spread. Similar with Scalia and Alito, they're considered very similar judges. They have a similar philosophy of originalism and all this stuff, but we see that there is something different going on in this, this second dimension. So I'm you know, certainly not a legal expert, not even close, <laughs> barely even a legal amateur, but part of what got me interested in this topic from the beginning was just a few years ago, you know, there's been decades of papers, you know, I haven't read these or followed these because I'm not in the field, but looking up, there's been decades of papers studying this kind of one dimensional layouts and how they trend and patterns and all that. Just, I guess now five years ago was the really the first paper that said, hey, let's look at the second dimension. And what they did was, um, you know, mathematically straightforward, but legally it was pretty advanced, was they said, let's run two dimensional MDS and let's go through a whole bunch of cases. They, the authors there actually are like law professors, so they know how to do this. They went through a whole bunch of cases and they tried to develop an interpretation of the second dimension by looking at individual cases where maybe Scalia voted one way and Alito voted the other way, and they would try to come up with an interpretation. What they did, but it's sort of a work in progress. They have another paper recently that found, um, well, okay, I'll start with the first one. They found that the in this two dimensions, again, you have to be careful because there's now a left-right symmetry and a top-bottom. So if I run the algorithm again, it might flip this vertically. So you have to be really careful to try to do it consistently. But what they found is at least the way it's oriented here is the bottom the, the, of the y-axis corresponds to what they call pragmatism. Roughly speaking, I mean, this sounds overly maybe insulting or naive, but basically it's, I kind of know what outcome I want and I'll sort of find a legal reasoning to get me there. You know, like I know this is absolutely what the constitution wants us to interpret and I'll try to find a way to get it versus legalism is what they found at the top. That's more, I don't even really think about the outcome. I just literally like very no. literal sense interpret the words and just see what ruling it leads to. No, so one question is, can't you look up, uh, uh, okay. Um, can't you look up the components to get some ideas? I see that Henry's already like uh, was writing a response, but uh, no, no, no. My response is just for the chat. Two uh -huh. questions back, but okay. yeah, you're, the question you're asking is good, Sarah. Yeah, let me let me start with Sarah, and then if you have more, I'm happy to go through. So, I mean, what that's more or less what this paper is doing is is they said, okay, we look at this picture and we see that Scalia 
and Alito have very similar X coordinates, and we know they're both conservative, and they're very different Y coordinates. So they tried to find specific cases that where they disagreed, and then they tried to actually, let me pretend it's simpler than it is. Maybe they agree on abortion rights cases, but gun rights cases, they didn't vote opposite. Then we know that the second dimension, it's not just conservative versus liberal, that's the x-axis. So that's not what they found, but this kind of general Are you still there? I think my internet cut out for a second. Yeah. Are you there? Okay. So that they just tried to kind of interpret these things, but you know, it's tricky. What they actually did was a few years later published another paper saying we were a little bit wrong in that first paper. It was it was too naive to think there was one global interpretation of the y-axis. They actually found that if you look at cases on certain topics, like free speech cases, they had an interpretation for the y-axis. But if you look at um like federative, like states versus federal government rights cases, the y-axis had a different interpretation. So basically the x-axis seems kind of to have an invariant interpretation. All cases, it always seems to be liberal conservative. The y-axis is a little bit more murky and it, it kind of depends on which group of cases you're looking at. And it might change over time. So it's it's tricky. So it's a little bit, basically there, there's some information there but they kind of warn us against reading too much into any concrete universal interpretation. That's you know the the interface between math and real life. In math, we want things to be fixed and and unvarying, whereas in real life, you know, you have some ideas of what the y-axis, but it's it's not so constant. Okay, are there more questions at this point, or should I keep going? All keep right. going. All right. So I just want to highlight. It's a little bit hard to see, but what I tried to do is highlight in bold the justices that form the majority of a particular case that occurred during this, this span of six years. So this one, I didn't count how many times it occurred, but this was the most, a very, very common one. These are, so by the way, since it's nine, an odd number of judges, they really um, just do majority vote. So if five justices vote, you know, let's say affirm and four vote reverse, then the case will be affirmed. So it is just a majority, which means getting five votes out of the nine is the critical threshold. That's part of why the, the court does not function well when one justice leaves. Once you're down to eight and it's an even number, how do you break ties? So they try to keep it at nine. Okay, so this comes up a lot. The five conservatives are the majority, the four liberals are the minority. You know, not much to say, that's kind of what you'd expect. But I just wanna say, here's an example of a case. Um, I think there was a handful of cases that actually voted this way. These were the justices in the majority, these five bold ones here, and the four ones down here were the minority. That's pretty shocking, right? If you think of the court as being liberal, conservative, stratified, we have the far left justices over here. We also have these two far right justices. You know, it's an alliance of these very liberal justices and these very conservative justices, yet we're missing this liberal justice, this conservative ones, and these two centrist. In other words, if you just look at the political axis, the one you hear about in the news, this is completely scrambled. It doesn't make any sense. But now look in the two dimensions. If you believe this um, interpretation of legalism versus pragmatism, it's immediately clear what was ideologically separating these. These are the, I forget which direction is which, but these are all the legalists voted one way and the pragmatists voted the other way. I might've gotten that backwards, but you get the point. You know, in mathematical terms, this is clearly separated by a horizontal line rather than a vertical line. And yet, you know, that's something that's never really discussed in the popular media and even in a lot of uh, legal and political science realms. So that's kind of the hint of where I want to go, which is, hold on, some cases are not splitting politically, but they still have a G. This is awesome. This is very geometrically consistent. You can even try to interpret it, but it's not liberal conservative. So that's, that's making progress of using the second dimension. So we were curious how obscure or frequent is something like that. So we made a tally, I should have counted how many, like weighted these by the number of times they happened. But throughout this span of years, this is a list of all the different collections of five justices that formed the majority in a five to four case. So for this first part of the talk, I'm just gonna look at five to four votes 
and I'm gonna focus on the five justices that form the majority. And what you see is there are 16 different ways we could form a majority. Let me highlight a couple of these. Uh, the red one here is the five cons most conservative justices went one way. The blue one here is the five most liberal justices went one way. This is where you, uh, the most common interpretation view of the court, how we think about it, liberals vote one way, conservatives vote the other way. And if you notice, Kennedy is the, the centrist swing vote in the middle. So if, if it were the case that the four liberals always vote together, the four conservatives vote together, that means Kennedy could single-handedly decide every single case, right? If he goes with the liberals, it's a liberal ruling. If he goes to the conservatives, conservative ruling. So it often is that case and that's why so I'm not going to touch game theory, by the way, but just to mention, because it's kind of fun finding math here, there's some interesting game theory papers, because here's the basic premise. There's nine justices and each vote is equal weight, right? Every justice has a vote that's either yes or no, and they're all counted equally. But because of the way they're kind of laid out geometrically in this one dimensional axis, the far left justices actually have less voting power than the centrist justice, because the centrist justice has one way you can measure this, again, this is not relevant for this talk, but it's kind of a cool thing I saw. Um, take a justice like Ginsburg, who's far left, go through all the cases she voted in and count how many where the case would have had the opposite outcome if she fl uh, flipped her vote and no one else did. And the answer is not too many. Usually if a case went her way, other, there was enough other justices. Whereas if you take a centrist just, justice like Kennedy, it turns out that there's many cases where if he flipped his individual vote, the entire outcome of the case would flip because he was in the middle. So I think it's really cool that from an abstract perspective, each one has one ninth of the total voting power. From a, a geometric perspective, that's not the case. The centrist ones have more voting power than the extremist ones because they, they would flip more cases by flipping their vote. So that, I don't know, there, there seems like there's something interesting there where it's an interplay between game theory and voting power and also geometry because the, the distances matter. Okay, let me just highlight a couple others. I forget which of these is which, but among the orange and the green, one of those is the, the vertically highest five voted as the majority versus everyone else. The other is the, the Southern <laughs> five voted one way. So it's just to say this did happen. We do have a horizontal line that separates liberal from conservative, or sorry, vertical. We have a horizontal line and a vertical line that separates. But we also have 14 other ways that the judges spread themselves out. So mostly what I was interested in when I was doing this project was, is there a geometric interpretation for some of these other 14? It doesn't mean you could predict how people vote, that you'll explain it, that you have a judicial philosophy. I really just wanted to know, is there some geometric sense like there was here, you can easily say this is a liberal versus conservative vote. Here you can say it's a it's separate on the vertical axis. So I was just curious, is there some geometric way of making sense of these, you know, more of these other 16? So what people do in the in this field is they come up with what are called spatial voting models. So these are kind of general things, but the, the details are what really make it work or not. So the way a spatial vo voting model works is each voter, so here we have capital N, uh, in our case it's going to be nine but I'll just state in the general way. Each voter you're gonna assume has some coordinate. So if there's 16 of us in the room, each of us has some coordinate that's supposed to reflect, they call it ideal points. That means like your ideology. So Henry might have his coordinates over here. I might have mine over here. It just represents how we kind of locate ourselves in this space of ideology. You don't have to identify that space. It just is what it is. The outcomes of the case, in our case, it's binary because it's a firm reverse. Those are just gonna be two points. So let's just do a simple case where we have kind of two dimensions. So maybe I'm far to the left and a little bit north, Henry's far to the left, a little bit south. If one outcome of this case, let's say P is, I don't know, affirming some first rights, first, um, first amendment case or whatever, P is gonna have some location and Q is gonna have some location. And the idea is roughly speaking, the location of the voters relative to the location of the case outcomes is supposed to give you some way of trying to predict how people vote. So in a very simple way, you know, if you have a bunch of people who are far to the left and some are far to the right, usually there's gonna be one outcome of the case that's kind of on the left. That's the liberal outcome interpretation or outcome of the case and there'll be a conservative one. But what's fun is to kind of make this more precise. So 
spatial mo voting models always have these things called voter preference functions. They just assign a number to the two outcomes. We haven't used the geometry yet. We're going to get there in a second. They just assign a number. And the idea is the model is each voter will choose the outcome that gives the greater number. So to make this more concrete, let me give you a specific case or a specific uh, spatial voting model. So probably the most common one, I just gave it this name because I didn't really see it in literature, but let's use it for now. Let's just call this Euclidean distance preferences. Maybe actually that one was in the literature, I can't remember. But the idea is the basically that my preference will be the distance between my ideal point and the outcome point. We put the minus signs because you want to be more inclined to vote for the thing that you're closer to. So this is just a way of saying a larger distance will make me less likely to vote for it. OK, so now we can kind of picture we're all on the plane somewhere. Some case comes along, and maybe affirming it is over here and reversing it's over here. All the justices that are near this point are going to vote one way, and all the justices near this point are going to vote another way. That's not claiming that's how it really works, but that's what this particular voting model would, would say. So here's another one. So the first one was standards out there. The other two I came up with because the, it turns out the first one, I forget how many, but it was kind of compatible with maybe like eight of those 16 configurations. And I was curious if there's other geometric ways of getting more, I forget the exact numbers. So here's one I called sphere of influence, which is we're gonna associate a radius to each of the two outcomes. And I'll just read in words what these models mean. You're gonna, you're going to like an outcome if you are within its radius, meaning you're within its sphere of influence. So now, you know, I've not just two locations, but I have a sphere, uh, a, a ball around each. And if I'm in this ball, I'll vote for it. If I'm in this ball, I'll vote for it. Otherwise, I'm not really interested in either. And you can figure out some way of breaking ties if, if it comes up. Then another one is just kind of an asymmetric version where if I'm in, we'll just have a radius for one of the outcomes. Anyone who's in that radius will vote for that outcome. And if you're outside of that radius, you'll vote for the opposite one. So instead of having two sort of centers of attraction, we'll just have one. You're either in it or you're not. OK, so I have these abbreviations because it's annoying to say them all. So EDP, SOI, and TOLI, I call this one. So I'll, I'll kind of remind you as, as we go. So I, I only have one theorem, and it's, you know, it's an undergraduate level theorem because it was an undergraduate project, but it's still kind of fun to talk through. So let me, let me do this, and I'll show you more pictures. So um, I haven't defined a coalition, but let's just say now that you have these models, um, a coalition is a collection of voters that could form either the majority or the minority in a particular case according to this model. So let me say that one more time. The model says each person has some location and the outcomes for cases will have locations. And based on that, the model will label each person as you know, voting for one outcome or the other. And whichever outcome has more votes is called the majority. The other one is called the minority. So um, each of these no, different I'm spatial sure. voting models yeah. is going to uh, um, kind of allow different collections of judges to vote together. So this will make uh, a little bit more sense when I show this picture. So it turns out that. Uh, the... No, can you hear me? Oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So one uh, question from the audience: Does the voting space have some non-trivial topology? No, that's a good question, and that's that's a direction I'd love to have other people <laughs> think about. But so far, this is just working in a Euclidean space, and all I'm trying to do is kind of mess up sort of the metrics or you know the way you're building these models out of it, but. There's no topology so far in the, the space itself. At the end of the slide, I'll, I'll show us um, some ideas I've tried, maybe slightly less successfully, to do some non Euclidean thing, but I'll, just one little idea in that direction. But great question. OK, so it turns out that the, the coalitions, the people who can vote together according to the Euclidean model, are exactly the ones that are separated by a hyperplane from the, the opposite group. So, you know, that's not immediately obvious from the definition, but it's it's pretty close to it. Um, I'll show you a picture that illustrates, basically proves that in you know one picture. So, okay, to be sep to be a form of coalition in the Euclidean model is really the same thing, same thing as saying there's a hyperplane. But notice when we look in the political direction, we're just talking about kind of a a hyperplane in one coordinate direction, 
And we started to, you know, we had this awareness of, oh, we can also look at hyperplanes in another coordinate direction. So now we see the Euclidean distance model is basically generalizing that to say, we're going to allow judges to vote together if there's any hyperplane, but it doesn't have to be, you know, in a coordinate orthogonal direction. But that, that's all it allows. Okay. Um, the next thing to note is that these um, Euclidean allowed ones or these hyperplane separated ones, they're actually exactly the same thing as these sphere of influence coalitions. So even though the voting models are different, the coalitions, the judges who all vote together or not, end up being the same set, um, the same possibilities using this other model. And the Tioli one is um, what the strictly more general. So if you're one of these first two models, then you're also allowed by the Tioli model, but not conversely. And I'll, I'll show you pictures and examples. Okay, so here's a picture that's basically the idea for this, this first statement, which is the EDP model says, a coalition is I have a, um, a ball that contains the majority, a ball that contains the minority. So let me just draw pictures for five, four. So these five justices all line one ball, these five justices line another ball. And what you can do is just take, to find a hyperplane that separates them, just take the centers of the two balls and draw the straight line segment between them and then take a, a perpendicular hyperplane that's exactly at the, the limits of the radius. So in other words, um, these two balls, you can kind of expand them until they're tangent and then just take a, a fit a tangent plane in there that plane is definitely gonna separate these two. Um, the balls could overlap and intersect a little bit, but it turns out that doesn't matter because our assumption is we don't have a person who's in both of those simultaneously. I guess I should have mentioned that. Part of the assumption of this theorem is that we don't have any ties. So I'm, I'm not gonna worry about the case where someone is equally inclined to vote for two outcomes. So not much going on there. And conversely, if you are separate by a hyperplane, you can just draw, you know, this is, I made some of these slides for a less mathematical audience. So for you guys, this is easy. So if you're separated by a hyperplane, just take a point on one side of the hyperplane, look at its reflection across that, have that be the center of these balls. And as you kind of move those points further from the hyperplane and expand the radius, um, basically the, these balls here are gonna kind of flatten out and their decision boundary will approach this hyperplane. So a little hard to digest it you know, in, in 30 seconds in a talk, but it's nothing more advanced than that. That's why this is a, a really fun undergrad project is we didn't have to know much law. We could already find some fun math here. Okay, these are the pictures for the, the next one. It's not much more complicated, but it, it's still kind of just fun undergrad type of math, which is, um... oh yeah, now I wanna, I wanna look at this second statement, which is that your hyperplane separated if and only if you're the sphere of influence model allowed. So I have to remember how this goes. <laughs> this is the thing from a year ago that I've already forgotten. So if you, yeah, so the sphere of influence means I have two spheres, they may overlap, but my assumption here is going to be all the majority is on in one ball, all the minority voters are in the other ball and that there's no voters in the overlap. So the spheres can intersect, but there's no voters in that intersection. So here's what you do. Um, if, if the spheres are disjoint, then it's trivial to form a hyperplane that separates them. So let's just make life a little bit harder and assume the spheres are not disjoint, so they overlap. The intersection of two spheres is a sphere of one lower dimension, right? In this case, these two balls intersect in a circle. You can just take the hyperplane spanned, linearly spanned by that um, sphere of one lower dimension. So in this case, I have a three-dimensional, I have a ball, a ball, they're intersecting at a circle, take the plane that extends out that circle. And by our assumption, that plane will separate the voters in this one sphere from the other. So that's an argument that shows if you're in this sphere, if you're separated in the, in the sphere of influence model, then there's a hyperplane between you. And conversely, if there's a hyperplane between you, um, kind of the same argument here, then you can find spheres on opposite sides that contain everyone. Because, you know, a large enough sphere looks like half of a hyperplane. Okay, so that's that's pretty much all the math in here, but I just wanted to show that because it's kind of fun. So here's some um, examples. Again, in bold are act, are is an actual outcome from a case. So this is not mathematical. This is you know really happened. 
the bold is a majority from a case that actually happened. Now I just want to kind of interpret these using these models. This is the simplest standard one, the conservatives, including the centrist Justice Kennedy. So he was the swing vote and he swung to the conservative side. This you know, is kind of compatible with any model you can imagine. You wouldn't introduce a model that doesn't allow for the obvious conservative group blocking, for conservative versus liberal that ha does actually happen frequently. But nonetheless, let's just go through it co concretely. I can imagine a sphere of influence somewhere around here that's grabbing the conservatives, one over here that's grabbing the liberals, or I could imagine a hyperplane down here, that, or a line in this case down here that's separating them. So you can kind of see how all the models would work there. In this case, this again was an actual case that occurred. It turns out you actually can separate by a hyperplane here, which means by the theorem, this is compatible with all the models. But if you just intuitively look at it, why would these conservatives have voted, I'm not these conservatives, why would these justices have voted together? If it were just these five, it kind of makes sense, they're the conservatives. Why did Breyer join them? Well, you know, again, I can't really proclaim a legal interpretation, but the geometric one seems a lot clearer. There was something located over, you know, this is not saying it really is, but here's a, an interpretation. Maybe there was something over here that, uh, you know, one of these kind of outcome locations that had a small sphere of influence. So it grabbed these three justices because they were very close to them. And everyone else was kind of too far from that point. So they all voted the opposite. So this is where I'm kind of suggesting maybe voting can be asymmetric. Maybe these three found something in the case that made them want to vote one way. And it's not like there was something that unified all the others. Maybe it's just all the others weren't convinced by that perspective, so they voted the other way. So that's what this TLD one allows for is it breaks the symmetry and says, maybe you either take it or you leave it. It's not that there's two uh, you know, outcomes that are kind of appealing in different ways. I have no idea how plausible that is legally. You know, let's just move past that because I can't answer that. But I think it's fun to kind of think about these different options. Here's another one where I think just, no, actually I think this one you can't even, so this really occurred. The majority was these four conservative justices, but then instead of the fifth vote being Kennedy, the swing vote, it was way over here, this far left Justice Stevens. What the heck was going on there? You know, who knows? Obviously real life and law is not as simple as, as the math we're pretending it is, but, whoops. But thinking in terms of these geometric models, I can kind of see this as a take it or leave it where there's a sphere of influence down here that grabbed these four and everyone else kind of didn't go for it. This one I think is my favorite picture that kind of suggests that. These five are not far left or far right, right? They're not the conservative justices, they're not the liberal. So it doesn't look like a political case. The closest you would say if most legal scholars looked at this is, oh, those are the centrist judges. Right? The extremist judges voted differently, but the centrist judges on the left to right axis, that judge is centrist. So what the heck is going on with this Justice Black? Why didn't he, why was he centrist but didn't vote that way? Again, the real answer I'm sure is very complicated, but the geometric model is at least, it doesn't explain it, but it's compatible. It says there was some sphere of influence that these five said, hey, we all have a similar view. It's somewhere up here and we like this. And everyone else was too far away. And they said, eh, we're not convinced. We're gonna vote the other way. So again, massive oversimplification, but I think it's just kind of fun to see how these models relate to these configurations that show up. Even if you don't give much credence to the models and you don't think there's much legitimate going on, one thing I want you to take away from this talk is this naive view of the court being just liberal versus conservative is so far from explaining what's of, you know, accurately representing what's going on. So you don't have to agree with what I'm doing, but you should at least disagree with what a lot of people are doing of thinking, going back to the question um, Solomon asked, to the idea that, hey, maybe the, the court is not just left to right. So when someone like Amy comes to the court, it's not simple that she's just a little more conservative. There's other axes and, and a lot of other complicated voting patterns that are at play here. So I just want to mention one other thing, and then I think I'm at a good point to, to call it quits here, which is, it turns out, so again, my, my main motivation wasn't to give legal scholars some profound interpretation to cases, because I can't. You know, the model doesn't explain what's going on. It's just to find interesting mathematical structure that's showing up. And again, I, I hope there's richer math, there's further steps, there's maybe a little bit more topology. 
So I just want to mention a couple things because this gets a little closer to topology. As I was exploring this, it turned out there's something in the mathematical lit literature called a K-set, which is a, if you have a configuration of points in theory in any, I guess I've only seen this in Euclidean space, but if you have a bunch of points in Euclidean space, a K-set means a set of points that can be separated from all the remaining points by a hyperplane. And it turns out there's a line of literature, I think it was in like the 80s and 90s, kind of computational geometry as the field, where people were trying to come up with bounds, like inequalities on the sizes of the k-sets that it could occur based on the geometry of the configuration or something. I forget exactly, but there is something in mathematics called k-sets, which are points that can be separated from other points in a configuration by a hyperplane. So it was kind of fun to realize, hey, this voting model is kind of an incarnation of this k-set idea. The other one that I actually like even more is it turns out this Tioli one, this kind of asymmetric take it or leave it one, this has a mathematical, um, I don't know if interpretation is the right word, but it, it closely relates to another concept in the math literature. So probably a lot of you, but maybe not everyone has heard of the concept of a Voronoi diagram. The simplest way to think about that is, let's just picture the plane. You have a bunch of seed points and you're gonna create a cell around each seed point that consists of all points closer to that seed point than to any of the others. And it turns out when you do this, you know, in Euclidean space with Euclidean matric, metric, what you get are a bunch of polyhedral convex regions. You get an interesting decomposition. It turns out that's useful in applied settings, but it even comes up in like number theory and geometry. So um, this is dual to something called the a Delaunay tessellation or triangle, sorry. This is a Voronoi tessellation. It's dual to a Delaunay triangulation. So these are legitimate mathematical things, but that, that doesn't directly tie into what we're talking about here. But it turns out there's something called higher order Voronoi diagrams. And there the idea is each convex region in the plane, you could do this in higher dimensions, but I'll just do the plane. So remember in the usual Voronoi diagram, each region is all the points that are closer to a given seed point than to all the others. The second order Voronoi diagram is the cells are all the points that are closer to a given pair of seed points than all the other pairs of seed points. So let me go crank this all the way up to the fifth order Voronoi di diagram. Let me use MDS to plot the nine justices in the plane. So those are now nine fixed points. And now let's consider the fifth order Voronoi diagram. That means each cell here is parameterizing the locations where the same collection of five justices are closer to that cell than to any other, than any other five justices are. So the easiest one to see is this blue region over here. This blue Voronoi cell is the four, uh, sorry, is the five liberal majority. So every blue point here is by, by definition, a point where these four liberal justices together with Kennedy are the closest five tuple of justices. Similar with the red ones, this is the cell that's parameter points where the five ne nearest justices are the five conservative ones. What's cool is we have this green cell here. That's the cell consisting of all points where the five nearest justices are the five northernmost ones. And I think this yellow one was the southernmost. That actually is the same, that's way back here, but that is the same yellow and green that we had in this picture. So this, I was really curious. Now we have these 16 coalitions that actually happened. One of them is obvious it's liberal. One of them is obvious it's conservative. One of them is still pretty obvious it's the Northern judges. One is the Southern, you know, not geographically, but in this MDS sense. So then I thought, wait a minute, I can just take the nine justices and compute all the Voronoi cells in the fifth order Voronoi diagram. And I can just see how many of these 16 actually correspond to a Voronoi cell. Unfortunately, the answer was it was okay, but it wasn't great. I think it was something like, um, I forget the exact numbers, but it was something like 80% of the actual coalitions, 70 to 80% of the actual coalitions that happen on the court do correspond to cells. Some of them were tiny cells, but they actually showed up. And similarly, something like 70 or 80% of the Voronoi cells correspond to a coalition that actually occurred. So, you know, it's a more flexible model, but I just thought it's kind of a cool geometric way of, basically the punchline for this is saying, um, instead of just thinking people either vote all conservative or all liberal, it's saying 
is there some point in the plane that kind of attracted its nearest neighbor justices? If so, then we kind of have maybe a guess of why those justices voted together. There was something cohesive about them that they were near each other. Okay, so that's, I didn't get to the non euclidean part, but I think that's good enough. So let me end there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I would ask everyone to unmute themselves and uh, uh, clap. And, uh, now it's time for questions. So again, everybody is set to mute. So if you want to ask a question, you have to unmute yourself first. Actually, I just remembered, I want to mention one thing, a question for this audience because of your background. Here's something I got stuck on. So if anyone has ideas, you know, not on the fly, but feel free to email me after. So this was all predicated on taking this matrix and just looking at voting agreements or disagreements. Because again, at the end of the day, every justice either votes affirm or reverse. So we can either say they agreed or disagreed. But the reality is there's these things called opinions. So what happens is multiple justices will write an opinion and other justices will either concur with that or they'll kind of write a rebutting opinion. So it might actually be the case that in one particular case, there was two opinions that both wanted to affirm the case, but for different reasons and various judges sign on to those. And then maybe a, a dissenting opinion that had the opposite perspective. So I just wanna say, I haven't figured out the math for this because I'm viewing this as binary, either vote together or apart. I don't know how to mathematically incorporate this idea of opinions that maybe you know, justices could agree on the outcome of the case, but for different reasons. And that's reflected in the fact that they would have different, um, different opinions. And this data of who, who wrote which opinions and who signed on and agreed with which, that's accessible. And there's these legal databases that store all this. So the data is out there. I just couldn't figure out a mathematical structure. And to me, that feels like it's, I don't know, getting a little bit closer to topology or at least network theory. There's something there, but I haven't been able to figure out. So if, it, if anyone has ideas, I'd be happy to hear. But sorry to interrupt and I'll, I'll turn it back to you for questions. Uh, no, I have a quick one. Okay. Oh. Ah, I'm sorry. Somebody is ringing at my place. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, Solomon, do you want to go? Uh, sure. So, um, first of all, thanks for the great talk. So, the, okay. the question is the, is the following. So, it does seem like the first component of the MDS embedding picks up on the political alignment, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, but there could also be for a fact, for, for an example, because maybe most of the cases that they were deciding on were of a political alignment nature. Mm -hmm. So it, it just it, it, in general, you know, if you think about it, like the nine justices and maybe the thousand cases is sort of a nine by a thousand matrix. Mm -hmm. And if you flip the construction and try to do an MDS embedding for the uh, cases, you might see that some of the cases were very tightly clustered. Mm -hmm. So it may be that, and again, this is maybe demonstrates my ignorance of what goes on at the Supreme Court. They may have been deciding on very similar kind of cases multiple time, which naturally skews the geometry. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, what are your thoughts? Do you think that something like that is happening? Yeah, that, that's um, a great, I actually hadn't thought about that, but that's a really great idea to kind of flip it around and think of the MDS uh, case centric rather than judge centric. One thing that's kind of lacking in my discussion here is the, the sort of multiplicities of the different coalitions. So. You're absolutely right that the reason the first dimension is political is even though I showed you that there's these 16 different ways that justices could be aligned, that's literally true. What I should really do, and I've never actually sat around to do this, is weight each of these. So kind of count the number of times this particular coalition occurs. If you do this, it's definitely the case that the red and the blue ones are by far the most frequently occurring. Hmm. So yeah, there's some really obscure oddball ones, but it could be the case that like maybe this green one only happened once in these six years. It, mm. it wasn't literally that rare, but it definitely was more rare. So there, you're absolutely right that um, certain coalitions are more frequently occurring. In other words, it's, it's not realistic to pretend all 16 of these are on equal footing. So I- well, I mean, more like certain, uh, certain cases are very- Yeah, that's right. Occur. right. Yeah, so that, that's kind of rel uh, related because there might be like a hundred cases where the liberals all voted one way. So that case is kind of, what's the similarity within that case? 
Hmm. Um, there's even additional data that one could look at. One could look at like the state, the lower court that the case came from. People tried to estimate what's the topic of the case. So I think it'd be interesting to try to do what you're saying, looking at the case centric perspective and try to even push further into data. Like, you know, maybe some cases are grouped into um, free speech cases and some into gun rights or, you know, you can look at the topics. It might be interesting to try to do the case centric MDS that you're saying and maybe do some kind of clustering or look into in that. Um, yeah, so I, I the answer is that does seem very interesting to me. I, had, I haven't thought about that specific duality that you mentioned, but that does seem worth pursuing. Um, but I think that what you said as far as explaining why the, the first dimension is political is, is absolutely accurate. The, yeah, it is that. true that if there's a phenomenon that separates the justices more often than any other, it is the politics. So my, my view is, yes, politics is kind of dominant and it drives a lot of cases, but there's also a lot more to the story than that. But as a first approximation, that is the best approximation. Originally, I, I had some naive goals of taking this Voronoi picture and weighting it because, right, like I just said, the most liberal and the most conservative are the most common. I would love if the, I could just like compute the area of this convex cell and say, oh, the area is supposed to indicate how frequently I expect that to be occurring. I still mm. think there might be something fun to do there, but I've never, like this yellow one was less frequently occurring than the red one. And the area seems to correlate, but I haven't figured out something, you know, I haven't yeah, taken that's that anywhere. <laughs> that's interesting. But this is what I love is there's just so many fun mathy things one could try. And the, remember the state of the legal literature is, it was a big breakthrough a few years ago to even consider a second dimension whatsoever. So all of this kind of Voronoi stuff is just out in the clouds. No legal scholars are looking at this and caring, but it's just fun to me that <laughs> now that you have two dimensions, there's a whole lot of math things that we could do to try to understand this data and think about it, interpret it, that you know, hasn't really been done. Um, you know, they, the legal theorists would want us to try to tie it back into actual cases and details, but I think it's just, I just never realized how interesting planar configurations of nine points could be, right? From a mathematician that seems so trivial, but now I realize oh, there's actually a lot of cool questions and things that one could look at. But yeah, I like, I like your case centric idea. Any other questions? I thank you. So I will stop the recording now and then okay. all the other questions uh, will be offline just like for time purposes. Thanks again. Good. Thank you.